It's a really my honor to introduce this this wonderful couple. Hey, they're um, Oneida, and they are going to talk about um, a lot of stuff. I was just at their booth and I was looking at their seeds, and they have wonderful seeds, and they have a food sovereignty initiative. They've been really busy, and to me, it's exciting that they're a resource now to other tribal communities because they have kind of been through things. They're, you know, with, as far as getting certified organic and their practices and, and how they treat um, their animals and what they're doing in the community. It's just wonderful. So I can't wait for them to share that with you. So Kyle, are you ready? Are you first? He's going to come on up. Let's give him a big round of applause. They come all the way from Wisconsin. Thank you. Yeah, we're cool. Thank you for everybody for showing up and checking out our presentation. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Carolyn for inviting uh, Jamie and I out to the museum. It's a great honor uh, for the Oneida Nation to be here and share our rich agricultural history. And also, uh, Carolyn's staff. We have to uh, thank them as well. They uh, yesterday made sure that some of our cultural act, uh, items made it back safe to our hotel with that crazy rain we had yesterday. Segu Segwake, Date Galiwak, Aniota Aga. Greetings, good morning, Wastachus Lee. My name is Date Galiwak, two matters connected. Uh, my English name is Kyle Wisneski. How was that? <laughs> okay, we'll get started. Great. John Hequa, it's uh, at uh, Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. It's in our language. It's our uh, certified 83 acre certified organic farm. It means uh, life sustenance in our language. We also have a, a cultural teaching center on farm where we really try hard to uh, promote our cultural, agricultural activities. Uh, we also have an indigenous seed source at our farm. We, at the present moment, we hold over 80 different types of indigenous seed that uh, range from zero years old to 500 years old. Uh, and we still do cultivate those seeds today. So we're very proud of our seed bank, our, what we like to call is our seed library. We also have a, a good selection back at our booth. We really hope that you'd come and visit us after our presentation. I'm also a uh, co-founder of the Midwest Indigenous Seed Keepers Network. So I work with the uh, states of the tribes and states of Michigan, Iowa, uh, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Uh, we work together uh, to promote indigenous seed and for indigenous communities to bring those seeds back or bring them back home and cultivate them and use them. Just don't hang on to them. We really promote uh, the use of the seed. As well as uh, keeping the seed, we believe that the story is just as important that goes along with it. So in our seed library, you'll see a lot of the information of the families that grew it, uh, how old that seed is, and what we do with it, and how you prepare it for food. It's very important uh, to also eat it. Uh, we have sustainable uh, food pathways. Uh, we are uh, tribally um, funded, and we also do uh, go after uh, a few grants. Uh, one thing that we are um, very proud of is uh, the way we treat our animal. So we do have some animals that are non-indigenous to the Oneida people on the farm, and I'll talk about that a little bit later with how we treat our animal and um, why that, you know, maybe with the chicken and cow are not culturally irrelevant to the Oneida Nation, but I'll... Uh, comment on why they are important to us. We have a, uh, a poultry operation on our farm at Chunhinkwa. Currently we have 30 layers. Uh, we produce over 10,000 eggs. Uh, we do sell a very minimal amount of those eggs to our Oneida market that we had set up for entrepreneurs, uh, small family farms uh, on the reservation. So they have an opportunity to sell their product uh, at a native store. They don't have to try to you know, go out into these big groceries and, 
you know, try to get into the big box stores. So we really try to uh, find an avenue for them to have a, you know, a place to sell their product. We also do uh, what we call broilers, and that would be a meat bird instead of a laying egg, a laying chicken, sorry. Uh, we do uh, process our own uh, birds on site. We have a, what we call a CPU, a central processing unit, where we invite all of our community members to uh, come out and use that facility for free. Uh, just to uh, give them an opportunity to raise that animal, but also, you know, see to it that they have a place to harvest it and uh, make sure they have a clean facility to use. And the, the type of bird that we use is a, a Rhode Island red. So we do have a, a sustainable cow-calf operation. You can see our bull there and our young man standing strong with him there. He's challenging him, I guess you could say. We uh, currently have 30 animals. They are uh, all grass-fed beef. They do not eat any grain. Uh, so we are um, very proud of that. Uh, we believe that um, cattle are, were not ever meant to eat grain and that we um, really try to keep them 100% uh, grass-fed. A cow calf operation um, with our community. Uh, some of our community members come through hard times where they maybe they cannot feed their animals or something happens, you know. So we offer up our farm uh, to take an animal on from a family that maybe just cannot handle that animal anymore. So we really want to be an avenue for our community to, um, to produce a great animal, great meat. Like I said earlier, we do have a, what's called the Oneida Market on our reservation where a lot of the community members, again, can utilize that market to uh, sell their produce or their meats. A uh, lot of our produce, eggs, and uh, beef go to our emergency food pantry. We also have a regular food pantry. Uh, the emergency food pantry was developed uh, less than two years ago. Um, we found out that the food pantry on the reservation had a lot of paperwork. Families had to drive into the city of Green Bay. A lot of them are in the outskirts of Green Bay. Our reservation is 65,000 acres. Uh, our reservation runs into the southwest side of the city of Green Bay. So a lot of our members, including ourselves, live in the city of Green Bay. And that emergency food pantry, uh, they only have one piece of paper to fill out. So we really figured out that that was a good way for them to be able to handle some food. Our cow-calf operation, um, produces all of our fertilizer. So we do not want to support the big egg. So our cow-calf operation, uh, we follow uh, our cows with the white corn. The white corn is our most prolific crop that we grow. It's part of our creation story. And we have very, very minimal, very minimal inputs. So our cattle do a lot of work on the farm, um, and including uh, producing all of our fertilizer. Our corn, our corn rotation is on a four-year rotation, uh, so we do not grow our corn in the same spot every year. And then the cows use up that pasture and will eventually be back into that same corn plot uh, three years later. Uh, so that also helps us without getting any kind of, uh, uh, buying any kind of fertilizer. It's also, our corn rotation is also uh, very healthy for the land, very healthy for the environment. We have very little to none uh, things eroding into our creeks, our rivers. Uh, we do, on our farm, set aside about 25 acres that we do not farm, we do not touch, just for a buffer for our lakes, our rivers, and things like that. So it's kind of unheard of uh, in today's age to just give up 25 acres of land that we do not produce anything on. It's important to us, you know, to protect the environment. Uh, like I said, our animal relationship with our cattle, uh, we never drive our cattle with any type of vehicle or four-wheelers or anything like that. Never shock our animals. Um, most of our animals never receive any veteran, uh, veterinary care. Uh, we never separate them from their mother. We let that happen on their own. Um, we found out that um, we never have to call the vet unless it's a very, very severe situation. We won't let the animals suffer, absolutely not. So we will call a vet in for that situation. Um, I've been there 15 years and we've called the vet in less than 10 times and within 15 years. Um, conventional farms, I would imagine, call the vet very uh, much more. 
And we're very proud of our, uh, our breed. We use a Galloway breed. It's a very short animal, very long haired, uh, very, very much uh, um, adjusted to the grass fed lifestyle. It's, from, uh, it's a breed from Scotland and uh, we're very proud of it. And it's a, a very hardy animal. Uh, our animals do not come in to the barn at all year round. As you can imagine, Wisconsin uh, has some very, very tough winters. These animals are in tune with winter. They enjoy it. They have all the exercise they need. They're never confined. They're never confined in a barn. Whoop. Excuse me. So I did talk a little bit about our grazing and pasture plan. We do have uh, 30, uh, close to 35 acres of pasture with the uh, 30 animals, so it's very important to us that we're grass-fed. One thing, the challenge with grass-fed beef is you need to have a lot of land. So I think that's the reason why maybe a lot of these conventional farms uh, went away from uh, grass-fed is because you do need a lot of land. We um, particularly need at least an acre per head per cattle is what we found out is great for the animal. Um, it, you know, gives them enough food and things like that. So our pasture plan, uh, we do what we call uh, intensive rotational grazing. So we have three different pastures of around 11 acres, and we break those 11 acres up into very small acreage. So maybe one or two acreage, so that the 30 animals would sit on one or two acres at one time for one or two days, and then move on to the next pasture, move on to the next pasture, and so on. By the time they get through all the pastures, they come back to that first one, the grass is all lush and ready to go again. So it's a very sustainable you know, operation. It's very, very healthy for the environment. It's one of the things why we do a rotational. There's also, you can also do a passive rotational grazing where the animal would stay on for maybe three to seven days on a pasture. But we found out uh, that keeping that animal moving on the landscape it's very, very impactful on the environment. Uh, like I said, we have almost zero waste going into our uh, rivers and creeks. Our grazing and pasture plan, like I said, uh, the white corn is our, by far our most important crop that we grow at Junhequa. It's our cattle, it's all geared towards bumping our yield up for the white corn. So it's not, it's not a money maker for us at all. It's a way to you know, increase our yields. It's a way to not support big egg by, you know, buying all these uh, inputs and things like that. So our cattle are specifically on the farm for the white corn. That's why we brought the animal in. Um, like I said, it's not a big money maker for us. It's just a, a sustainable way of life. And like I, I also uh, touched on briefly about the rotational grazing and how it's uh, wonderful for the environment and the animal. So rotational grazing with the animal, uh, they have all the exercise they want, all the sunlight they need, and they actually have a little salad bar out there, you know, so they get to eat what they want, and it's very healthy for them. Our most important crop, our heirloom white corn, flint corn, we have uh, some examples back on our booth there. We would like for you to come visit and check that out. We grow 10 acres currently. Um, and our community is wondering when we are going to be growing more because we cannot produce enough white corn for our community at the time and our, none of our products leave the reservation. We don't have any product excess left over. Our community members have really uh, supported us in that, in that initiative. Um, maybe someday um, we do plan to grow about 18 to 20 acres next year um, with white corn and we are doing some testing you know, with some of our white corn uh, maybe doing, um, uh, currently we do uh, cultivation with tractors and things like that. Of course, we don't use any pesticides or insecticides to keep any of that, you know, weeds down. So we are still uh, using tractor and old style cultivators to keep the weeds down in our cornfields. We also do a traditional seed soak or what we like to call a seed medicine. So before we plant our white corn, uh, traditionally we use a may apple plant. Uh, we would boil that may apple cool it back down um, and let that seed soak in there for up to uh, 24 hours. And that's our protection. Some people use, like I said, insecticide or, um, and things like that. Um, that is our protection. Uh, our biggest thing is crane, so it would cover up that scent of the white corn 
It also protects it from insect and anything like that. And we've been using that type of method uh, since time immemorial. We also have uh, an opening planting ceremony as well as a harvesting ceremony. Uh, we are very uh, fortunate to have been planting around our moons. Uh, so we, um, we feel that it's very important you know, to plant around the moon. Uh, at certain times, we believe the moon has the ability to pull our seed out of the ground. So it's important. Uh, there's a certain amount, a couple of days that we look forward to and we target that we need to get our white corn in. It's also a 110 day corn, which is a very long corn, you know, especially for us up in Wisconsin, we don't have, you know, a very long growing season. So it's imperative, you know, that we get this corn in at a certain time, not only for the amount of days that it takes, but to, you know, hold true to our culture, you know, and follow those uh, moon phases. All of our corn, as you can see in our cool little pictures there with our youth, our youth are very active on our farm. It's all uh, hand harvested. All of our corn is hand harvested over 10 acres. We'll continue to do that. Um, so we bring in uh, um, the hands to uh, we ask our tribal schools and our, uh, our surrounding communities to come in and help us uh, to pick that corn. Our dry down system is our traditional system. You can see a young lady braiding our corn. We also have a, a small braid on our, uh, our booth back there that you can check out. Uh, usually takes, our traditional uh, drying method would usually take about 20 minutes to create a braid. If you have never done it before, it usually takes about 40 minutes. Uh, the best braider that I know is Jamie here. Uh, last year she produced um, over 115 braids by herself. So these are at about six feet long and it's our traditional way of, uh, of drying the corn. We've tried many other methods. Uh, many, many other methods. We grow, you know, we have about 10,000 pounds that we produce. Uh, we've created um, gravity boxes, put false floors in there, brought in some grain drying fans. Uh, nothing works as good as our traditional method. It takes about a month to a month and a half for our corn to dry down. It comes off the field at about 40 to 50% moisture. So I don't know of any other corn that comes off the field with that much moisture in it. So there's no way that a machine could even pick it if you would want to. And our services, uh, our community supports us very much. So it, we find it imperative uh, to take care of them as well and offer them anything that they need, uh, which includes uh, one of our workshops I like to talk about is a seed and plant distribution that we hold in May of every year, uh, the beginning of May. Uh, we produce over 20,000 seeds we give away. We target 200 families in our community. Uh, 20,000 seeds and over 30,000 plants we produce in our greenhouse yearly. And we give that away and may at a very, very, very small fee. Very small fee. We've, we have given it away and at that time we've seen a little bit of waste. So we feel if they maybe pay $2 or $5 that maybe they uh, care for it a little bit more. Uh, like I said, we also have our workshop series uh, throughout the year, uh, 10 to 15 workshops, anywhere from uh, designing your garden um, and things like that, uh, uh, sage picking, uh, sweet grass uh, picking, um, garden, uh, strawberry picking, and things like that. Medicinal harvesting, we also go out into our community, which we call wild crafting. Uh, we would uh, offer up some tobacco before we do all these things as well. And we go through our communities and uh, fortunately we have our own environmental department that has now has starting to bring back some of those medicinal plants. Instead of uh, growing cultivated corn or soybeans or things like that, um, we have resolutions that pull land out of that activity every year and get put back into medicinal plants or grasslands or prairies or things like that. It's a very, very uh, great opportunity for our community. Uh, we'll also uh, give away those seeds and plants, but we don't want to leave you alone on that. So we'll uh, come right to your house and till your garden. We'll also plant your garden, help you weed sometimes. <laughs> Not all the time, but we do like to come in and uh, get our hands dirty. We feel it's very important to have a complete circle. You know, we don't want to just give you seeds and plants and then just leave you on your own. Uh, we talked about our, our traditional uh, tobacco. We grow our own uh, tobacco on our farm. Um, that is used for our ceremonial purposes only. Uh, we do not sell any of our indigenous seed. 
A lot of that seed that you see from our seed and plant distribution is certified organic, but we do buy that in. Our community gardens. So we have an outstanding community gardens. Uh, we have different places around the res. We have four different sites around our 65,000 acre reservation. And then Jamie also holds a, a community garden right on our site at Jinhinkwa, where she has over 40 families uh, right now in our community garden. And it is absolutely beautiful right now. Uh, we've been here since uh, Friday or Thursday. So we're a little worried about our garden. You know, it can get out of control within a couple of days. So uh, we've had a great time here, but we are looking back forward to get back to our gardens. Community gardens talked on that. Community rental and our equipment facility, like our CPU, like our central processing unit that we call it. Uh, we invite our community to come in and use all of our, you know, all of our equipment: uh, tractors, tillers, weed whackers, uh, little hand cutters, anything that you need to be successful to be a farmer. Uh, we want to make that easily readable to you. And then our greenhouse assistants. Uh, this year I had over 150 youth and over 100 uh, adults come in and help me in the greenhouse. Uh, for a long, uh, for about a year and a half, I was a one-man show at the farm. Uh, we had, um, and I needed that assistance. So we plant, sow the seed. We have to transplant all those 30,000 plants into a, a bigger cell. So it's a lot of work, you know, in those greenhouses as well as we have greenhouses full of strawberries, sage, and things like that. So that all needs to be picked you know, at a certain time. So we have a lot of volunteers that come in and help. And once again, our youth initiatives are uh, dear to us. Um, we know that um, the future, you know, revolves around our youth. Um, so we, the big part of our farm, maybe probably the most important part of our farm is to educate the youth. And we've seen an outstanding, you know, the, the amount of youth that have come in and they are much further along than I was when I was youth uh, with their knowledge of indigenous seed, uh, food sovereignty and food security. Uh, their knowledge is way above and beyond and we are not worried about our youth at all, you know, with our, with our food systems and things like that. Um, we follow our food seasons, our youth help us with that and that's basically part of our ceremonies. So a lot of our ceremonies follow our food system. Our first one would be maple syrup you know, and the next would be strawberry and so on and so on. In our horticulture area, like I said, our youth help us uh, with our strawberries, you know, the seed and plant distribution in the greenhouse, our table crop gardens, our medicinal plants and things like that. Our agriculture, uh, our youth would come in and help us uh, harvest the animal, um, figure out how to uh, butcher that animal and care for it, as well as um, help us move our animals, move the cows, um, the youth come in, it takes us no more than 10 minutes to, to move our, our cattle herd. All I do is, um, like I said, we don't drive them, we don't shock them at any point in time. So we would have a youth stand next to our gate, you open up the gate, they do their little yell, and the cows come. So it's very, very, very easy, you know, very easy farming compared to like a dairy farming or so. We let the cows do all the work, so okay. Uh, maintenance. So we teach our youth to uh, change oil, change a tire, uh, change tines on tillers, um, and things like that. We think that's very important. If, they're gonna, if we're gonna give that stuff out for free and let our community use that, uh, we don't want that stuff to come back broke. You know? So it has before. We hadn't done that in the past, and that's one thing that's new you know, within the la that last uh, three years or so, is to really sit them down and uh, give them a maintenance schedule. Seed stewardship you know, is very important to us. Um, people are losing their seed daily. Uh, we've been attacked, you know, by Monsanto and GMO uh, companies trying to uh, steal our seed. Uh, so we have uh, over 80, like I said, over 80 um, types of indigenous seed that we still hold and near and dear to us. You know, they have a story, you know, to us and uh, we feel if they were stolen uh, that we would never get them back. And obviously we have a cultural you know, relationship to our food. You know, just talking about our ceremonies there briefly, they're all based on our food seasons. Um, medicine and preservation methods, like I said, um, you know, we, we turn uh, farmland into uh, medicinal prairies uh, yearly, and we also have medicinal gardens and things like that on our farm. And we do uh, workshops, what we call number six, what you may know as bergamot. Uh, we call it number six because it's our six most used, six most uh, used herb 
on our reservation, and our small uh, animal science project. So we have the youth come in, you know, and collect the eggs, you know, you know, drive the cattle, move the cattle, and things like that. Um, it's very important to us to teach the youth at a, a very, very, very young age to care for that animal. You know, like I said, it's, we don't have a cultural relevance to the chicken or to the cattle or things like that, but the way we treat them is a culturally important to us, and we want to instill that into our youth at a, a very young age. Our Harvest and Husking Bee, this is our largest event of the year. It is our 20th annual. We are very proud of our 20th annual coming up this year. It is a community harvest fest, so we will have over thousands of people come to our farm and help us, uh, help us uh, harvest that corn and go through traditional techniques of braiding, uh, making rugs, making moccasins, uh, using the corn, uh, using the uh, cobs, so nothing goes to waste. Uh, we have a week-long education days where we'll have close to 800 youth come in from Monday through Thursday for our education days, and they go from different stations, from shelling the corn, husking the corn, what we call snapping, which is just picking it, and then we also give them a little hay ride and things like that. And we all use, like I said, we all use our cultural uh, techniques uh, during this event. Uh, like I said, there's no machine picking or anything like that. It's 100% uh, cultural activity in our community. Very important, our hands-on connection you know, to the corn and to our seeds. Uh, we have people uh, come to our booth here, and the first thing that the parents tell their kids is, don't touch. Don't touch the seed. You know, don't touch their items. Uh, we really think differently on that aspect. We believe you know, that the, spirit, uh, the seed, as you and I, have a spirit, and that it feeds off us. And the youth and adolescent are even more powerful. So we encourage people to come to our booth and touch our seed as much as you want. We believe that it gives it a power. So um, we're very different on that aspect. We very much encourage people to uh, have hands-on connection. And as long as our traditional workshops, I kind of touched on that. Uh, another thing uh, dear to us is our partnership with our uh, veterans. Uh, so we um, approached our, our Veterans Association on the Oneida Reservation with running our aquaponics system. And they were all for it. And they are doing a great job um, we want to, you know, invite everybody, you know, young, uh, middle-aged, and um, our veterans, you know, to take part in our food sovereignty initiatives. You know, and it was their generation that I felt that had, you know, been deprived of that. So we want to bring that back in our community, and our veterans are proud, you know, to be running that aquaponic system, and it is up and running, and it's, uh, it's phenomenal right now. And then we also have a, a traditional food challenge that Jamie uh, had put on at our annual Harvest and Husking Bee, so we'll give you uh, free white corn to any community member that would want to come in and uh, try to compete and see who can uh, create the best traditional uh, dish with our white corn. We don't judge you, our community judges you, so make sure that you would bring your best dish. Uh, it's a, a great way uh, for us to ask them to get creative. You know, we have traditional dishes of soup, gunna which is our bread and things like that, but we asked them to maybe create a dish, something different than that. So um, last year we had, um, I believe, 12 entries, and it went very well. We'll be doing it again this year at our 20th annual. And you can see some of our flyers there with the Oneida Soup Challenge. And our white, uh, the top one on the right there is our workshop that I hold for a white corn seed. Uh, as we you know, protect our seed and collect our own seed from year to year. We never open up a catalog or anything like that to buy our seed. Here you just got a couple of pictures. Uh, the young uh, lady on the left here is uh, in the process of uh, braiding our white corn. It's our traditional way of uh, drying. As well as the one in the middle, she is currently making a handle for the white corn. So it's all made by uh, the white corn. We keep our three strongest husk continue to braid that, put a cob in, braid it, put a cob in, braid it. We have 65 cobs in a braid. When it comes to the handle part, what she's working on now, it's just individual husk. So it's the same way, you're putting in husk, you create a long strand, you curl that over, as you can see she's doing, and that makes the handle. Uh, and then we hang it up in our corn shed. Uh, we currently have, we don't, well, we currently don't have any braids right now because we shelled it all, but we, every year we have close to 300 braids. So when you walk in to our corn shed, like I said, we believe that all these seeds have a spirit. It's the most uh, 
um, energized, and the second you walk into this uh, corn shed, you can feel the energy. I mean, it's a, an incredible place. And on the end there, we have some of our, uh, our renowned uh, elders, uh, Carol Elm and uh, Randy uh, Cornelius, and they're in the process of what we call husking the corn. So most likely a group of people went out into the fields and snapped it off the, snapped the corn, brought it in into a pile, and then we need people to also help us uh, husk it. So they're pulling husk all the way off if it's not seed worthy, and we call that soup corn. Or if it's seed worthy, then they keep the three husk on, and then we continue to braid. Egg tourism. Uh, it's fairly new. Uh, we've been doing that for about five years now. Uh, like I said, we have about 10 to uh, 15 workshops, traditional workshops that we do every year. Uh, we also do presentations like we are doing here as well. Uh, we also have uh, tours on our farm. We have sheets of papers that we send out to people that are interested in uh, coming to the farm. Uh, they fill it out for a presentation date and time. Uh, we do have over 250 tours and presentations that we do every year. That's why we need these uh, sheets to come in and out so we can keep our schedules straight. Uh, we do pasture walks. People come to the farm. Uh, we show them how we treat our animal, how we move our animal, um, show them how our pastures are doing and things like that. Uh, we also do plant uh, identification on the farm as well as throughout our reservation. So we'll give tours on walking through our different uh, medicinal fields and showing people what each plant is and what their use is. And then also, um, we don't sell a lot of our, uh, any of our seed and tobacco or things like that. Um, traditionally, as Oneida people, or I think as indigenous people, we would, we would trade. So we keep that tradition alive. Uh, we service over 500 of our community members that come into our farm uh, for our tobacco alone. So we just ask for a trade. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't like to give it away. Um, we feel that uh, if they give us a possession that they feel is worthy, uh, that they really are there for a good reason, you know, for that tobacco. Yeah, we go. We move on to the cannery. Sigoli, everyone. I really appreciate you kind of uh, spending a little bit of your time with us. I know these presentations can get a little long. I know they get a, long, a little long for me. I've got like a attention span of maybe 15 minutes. So I'm always like, come on, come on, come on, get to the point. So anyway, my name is Jamie Betters and I oversee the cannery. Um, and as he mentioned a few things with our youth initiatives and um, our community gardens. So one of the things with our Oneida Nation cannery is we promote self-sufficiency and self-reliance. So we help community members process their own goods as well as do value-added products. So our main responsibility, as he was kind of mentioning, and this is why it's so cool that we're hand in hand, it just happens to be that we're a couple. We met on the basketball court, not in the field. And so he played ball at St <laughs> Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Um, I went to uh, uh, Fort Lewis in Durango, Colorado. So that's just kind of our little uh, history. We've been together 15 years, married 10, and we have a six-year-old son. So some of the pictures that you see of the little guy is our son. We had to get him in there somehow, and we deeply miss him. It's our first time away from him. So with this corn production that we do, from what they harvest and other community members within the Haudenosaunee nations, um, we are able to process over eight to 10,000 pounds of white corn. And with that, with that yield, we do, we're capable of doing about 20 different products. Now when I first started, we had ample supply of white corn because we were just kind of getting going. And the beautif beautiful thing about um, our food system all started out of the cannery. So the cannery has been existent since 1987. So way before we had the casino, way before we had bingo, we had this cannery. And it was started with a county grant to promote nutrition, to really tie in with low, um, low income families. So the egg component really came about the cannery. It was like, okay, now we need to start growing food, right? Um, as well as starting community gardens. So I'm really proud to kind 
kind of oversee that area. So within those 30 years, there have only been three managers, and I happen to be the third. So when you kind of get caught into the cannery, you really get connected. I have a background in human development. I never, ever would have imagined that I would be overseeing a cannery or even going anything into food production at all. So it's pretty amazing, and I'm very deeply, deeply connected to our Onost, which is our white corn. So the, one of the great things that we do also is um, help uh, and put on workshops for traditional tool making. So we kind of want you kind of to get back and get connected in some ways of how we used to do it way back when. And so the first picture that you see is um, um, is our corn, our corn grinder. And the corn that's in there has been roasted on an open fire. So there's many ways that you can eat our corn and I think that's why it's um, incredibly versatile. So you don't think of it just as flour or you don't think of it just as corn. I mean, we also can make tamales from it, muffins. Again, the point of my job is to really integrate our white corn and help you look at your, your diets and so confirm a, um, conform a little bit to a traditional diet. As as much as we possibly can. So I want to make sure that you're eating white corn and kind of looking at what you're eating already. We all eat muffins, tamales, and all of that good stuff, pozole, all of that good stuff. So we want to incorporate our white corn and um, into that, into our diet. The middle picture is our gunastoja, which is our cornbread. So for the most part, when people think of cornbread, they may think of Johnny cake, yellow cake, and all of that good stuff, right? So our cornbread is actually boiled, it's not baked. And all it is is our white corn and one of our, um, our traditional beans. And that's it. So sometimes people may say, well, is it too bland? Well, I mean, you can add anything to it that you want. So we really enjoy a good butter, maybe some salt, maple syrup, you can eat it with meat. I mean, there's so many ways um, how you can eat our ganastohal. The third picture there is another process of our white corn. So um, the building that we're in, it's a large, large, large building. It's the largest building. Um, it's, we call it our admin building. So we have our law office there. We have our high school in there. We have our daycare in there. We have our IT people in there. And then we have the little gem of the cannery in there. So it's pretty, it's pre and the, um, our building was actually a seminary. So the history that we have in there is pretty, is pretty amazing. So with, when I mentioned the high school, we work hand in hand with the high school. I mean, they're literally walking by the cannery all of the time. So I will pull kids um, as much as I can to really get them connected and really kind of work in the cannery. So they are putting um, corn on dryer sheets, and one of our main product that we do is uh, dehydrated corn. So again, about 15 years ago, when we talk about this ample supply, it was about how do we get you to eat our white corn? And our mission was about how to reintroduce our, our traditional foods. Well, now it's about how to keep up with the demand. So it's pretty amazing the movement that we have and how our community has really grasped and bought in um, to, to that structure. And so currently, we, as he mentioned before, we actually had to uh, even go to our elected officials and we created a resolution so that people would not try to sell outside because the demand was so high. Our intent is to get our community, again, eating our foods. It's not about the golden nugget. We're not necessarily trying to make a lot of money. Um, yes, you have to purchase these products, but they're definitely affordable. So again, the really cool thing about our facility is that we are community-based. So if you had your own garden, if you hooked up with a, with a local farmer, or if you're part of our really cool community garden, you take what you yield and we help you make products. So whether that's applesauce, whether that's salsas, pickles, spaghetti sauce, um, all of that good stuff. And it's very, a very, very um, small fee, if anything. So again, we're really trying to po promote self-sustainability, self-reliance, and these are just some pictures of community members coming in for different reasons. One strawberry, one is applesauce, and one is um, white corn that a group of um, community members had um, come in as a co-op. And say, so they are growing about, I'd say, six acres of white corn. Because it's hard for Junhinkwa to keep up with the demand. And now the responsibility lies on you. So if you want more, we're really, really trying to engage you to grow more. 
So this is our yearly workshops that we put on. I mean, they're fun. They're just not traditionals. They're salad in a jar, all of that good stuff. We have a pickle workshop, because who doesn't like pickles and all of that good stuff? Um, so again, we really try to do kind of a lot of the fun stuff and the engagement, right, to get you, uh, to get you thinking about even food preservation. So one of the things that's very near and dear to my heart is our youth, uh, um, our youth initiatives. So I put on a summer youth program. It's a 10-week program. And one of the things, we've received a grant from W.K. Kellogg. We've also received grants from First Nations Institute. We've also received grants from Walmart. We've received a lot of different grants kind of um, touching on different aspects. So one of the cool grants that I received had to do with promoting a healthy snack, getting our youth engaged. How are we going to do that? So my first, first group came up with a trail mix. And we just happened to, it just went so well that that's actually what we do. So they created the logo, and you see the strawberry um, there on the top. And what we see is that the leader, that's the leader of the berries. So I'll kind of share a little story about our Sky Woman coming down and landing on the turtle's back. And with that, she was pregnant, and she had a child. And therefore, her daughter had twins. And so when she was giving birth, we say it's the left and the right twin, the good and the bad, right? So when you think of a rose, that's the good twin that has that beautiful flower, and then the bad twin has those thorns, right? That's what they create. And so, and so from that, when the left twin came out, which we consider the bad twin, it, they, um, they, that process actually killed her. So within her grave came our gifts, which we say our seeds and our medicines and our foods. So the tobacco that we have, we say that grew from her head. The uh, string beans and the beans that we care for for our three sisters came from her hands. The potatoes, we say, came from her feet. The squash, we say, came from her navel. The strawberry, we say, come, came from her heart. And the breast, we say, came from the corn we say came from her breast. So when we look at any mound systems, we always signify that as the breast. And we say that our eldest sister is the corn, and the leader of our berry is the awahit, the strawberry. So our youth kind of really, really embrace that. So what we have them do is go hand harvest the strawberries, the raspberries, and blueberries. And then they come back to the cannery and process them. So they dehydrate them, and they add an, a nut to them. Some, we started with a peanut, and it kind of got a little rancid quick on us. And then we went to granola. And then now we're in almonds. And so it's a great little prod, um, product. And you have to have something sweet and savory, right? I mean, you really do. So we'll add a small little maybe um, an M&M in there. And so the mixture of it is just, it really is good. And then they sell it in two ounce bags because the other part of how we want to engage our youth is to be able to public speak, to really look at you and really kind of get you engaged as well. So they're just kind of not looking down or kind of ashamed of what they're doing. We want them to be loud and proud. The other part is the business sense of it. So I teach you about the cost analysis. What does it take to make this product? I don't want you to go in there blind. I really want you to have a good grasp of being an entrepreneur. And so we want to be able to really, instead of being the only ones doing it, we want to be able to have you flourish and come up with a product. So again, the trail mix is, um, they go to the farmer's market and sell it. And they also have internal um, orders. And it's one of the things that we can't even keep up with. So we only do 1,500 bags within those 10 weeks. So not only do we do um, a food product, but we also do some of our traditional um, medicines. And one, and one of that is sweet grass. So we grow some sweet grass, and they actually will hand harvest and braid it up as well. And that's a, an item that we'll trade and we'll also sell. And all of the funds that we get from um, those items go back into the program. So I'm really proud of having a, a really cool, sustainable youth program. Because then I don't have to worry about grant money, because these days, everybody's fighting for the same grant. So again, the really cool project is our community garden. So we have almost about a two-acre 
craziness produce garden, and I think we've harvested just a lot of hundreds of pounds of cukes already in our three weeks. It's kind of amazing. And as long, and even though we've been in this game, um, you know, for a while, it's still amazing to me just being in the garden and things that are popping up. You know, we were in there a couple of hours, and we the green beans were literally growing in front of our eyes. And I'm not kidding. We were like taking pictures of this, and it's so amazing. You think that you know it all, but the reality is you're always a student of the game. So this is our son, Braxton, Dehahunjalas. This is, of course, we really, really want our kids, um, you know, to be involved as much as they possibly can. He's with his grandpa planting with the Honi to Shoni planting stick that we had made. And that is our beautiful corn up there that just, it is all hand planted all hand planted with our community members. So it's a little different concept of, um, of Junhinko because there's no way that we'd be able to hand plant 10 acres, right? So we have about an acre that we hand planted and we did that in about two days. I put the picture of the cukes in there because I'm not kidding about like, I think we were like four to 500 pounds of cukes that we harvested right before we got here. So we've got cukes coming out of everywhere. Zucchini, green beans, all of that stuff. So in the middle of all of those pictures is the logo of our community garden and what it represents is a seed. So if you really kind of look at it, you can see the outline of a seed and that's a sprout on the top. And those are our three sisters, the asanate gundili, the corns, beans, and the squash. And then we plant by the moon phases as Kyle had mentioned. And there, um, the swirls are the Iroquois symbol for water. And we want to engage and use our language and culture as much as we possibly can. We put a lot of funds into our cultural revitalization. So it's only fair that we really, really kind of, well, we jazzed up our garden, I guess you could say. So we uh, made some really cool banners and displays so that we can continuously see that language. So our kids continuously see that name and identify with it. Even by color, it, I mean, we really try to kind of use all different ways. So enough about all the fun stuff. So also, I'm an FDA food processor and regulator and deal with the USDA and all of that good stuff. So um, we want to make sure that as much as we are a sovereign nation, that we are educated, we are trained and licensed. And so one of the, one of the fun things, I guess, I, you could say that I do is um, I regulate all of our food stuff within our nation. And not only that, it's um, I'm kind of a... Uh, there's not many of me throughout Indian country, as we say. And it's really um, kind of tedious paperwork and all of that stuff. And I think I was younger, so then I didn't mind doing it. So anyway, when nations kind of say, hey, Jamie, where do we start? You guys are way ahead of us. Well, we started somewhere. So I'm able to kind of go to your, your nation and help you kind of get started, whether it's just a food handler certificate, getting your community to understand about food handling, and then once you get to kind of through that food handling, you get to the processing side of it. So then I'll help you get through those FDA um, files, forms, um, even with if you're going to do a, a certain product and be able to do your pHs and kind of regulate you and get you moving. Um, and so that has become a very, very big hit. And I kind of travel around to kind of get you started um, and also certify you. So the cool thing about what our food code is, is that yes, we've adopted the FDA food code, but we've also put a twist on it in some of our traditional ways. So when we talk about processing our white corn, we have to take that outering off, which we call is the hull. And our traditional method is using hardwood ash. So it was really hard to convince the USDA to put wood ash on their ingredient list. Um, but we persevered, we definitely persevered. And so when other communities were kind of, um, when we have wood ash as an ingredient and you're serving kids and you're, you're through a, um, and you have to comply with USDA, USDA regulations, right? They would not allow you to serve like our Gunnestohal to like your daycares and your youth, right? So now with that fight um, and that work that we've done with getting wood ash on the organic list, it's not, a, it's not even an issue anymore. So we're super proud of that. And that, uh, that also helps indigenous communities alike because we, we find that, and, and I'm sure that you realize is that there's so many similarities to us, whether it's the Christian, a Christian story that is similar to our, our story um, or even foods, foods alike. 
So again, as he talks about agrotourism and for what, um, and the part of the cannery side is that um, I'm able to kind of certify you as a master food preserver uh, and to kind of go through different uh, processes dealing with food, whether it's a high acid, low acid, an acidified product, whether you're doing dehydration, freezing, or even currently we're now into uh, freeze dried. And as I mentioned before, we do a food handlers course and we do workshops upon workshops on food preservation methods, conventionally and traditionally. We do a ton of presentations. We also do tours all of the time. We actually had to put in a window in the cannery so that we didn't keep having that uh, traffic of flow of when we're cooking food or stopping or not being able to meet, meet that. So um, that has kind of been nice too. And our services, so a lot of people will say, well, what are you using? How do, are you able to manage um, your mass production? Because we're only in a 500 square foot of uh, a, an area. It's not this huge, large cannery. So it's kind of funny when people come in and it really humbles me because they think it's like, they get so surprised like, this is it? This is it? And it's like, yeah, actually this is it. So the importance of our equipment has been the reason why we're able to, uh, to do what we do. So I'd love to talk about our partnerships because without our partnerships, we would not be able to do what we do. We would not have our success stories that we have. And so with our reservation boundaries, as he had mentioned, we're kind of on the southwest side of Green Bay. So our kids, based on where you're at, can go to 11 different school districts, not just ours. So we want to make sure that we're taking care of our Oneida kids that are everywhere within our area. So we've really t um, partnered with Title Seven programs. We do tours, presentations, workshops. We also do a six-week rotation um, of a traditional food. And so that has been, that has been amazing. I'm, I'm very surprised, um, at actually, all of the time when we have so much support of, from public schools. And I don't mean that in a negative way at all, at all, because it's really hard, no matter where you go, to, um, to serve food outside and bring it in. And so that's kind of a part of what I mean as well. So again, as I mentioned, we have the United Nations school system. We have a really ele uh, cool elementary and middle school, and our school is shaped out of a turtle. So it's super, super cool. And our high school is in the building that I'm in. So again, we're, we're easily able to kind of get those youth, whether they like it or not. So we have a lot of different retail outlets too. So if we're looking at value added products, we don't have an issue with selling our products. We have C stores, what we call our convenience stores. We have an Oneida market store that's kind of like an all natural store. And then we have a really cool farmer's market. So when you're in the area and you're coming to visit us, and again, go pack go, we're big cheese heads. So we love our packers, no doubt. Um, we also put on an LPGA tournament that we just got through. So we're big into golfing. We have a beautiful, beautiful golf course as well. So with all those enterprises too, you will see our food. So as he touched on with the vets, we've really, really hooked up with the vets for, for, um, for a number of reasons, not just for hands, but for a number of reasons. And we're really trying to kind of get them uh, moving on nutrition as well. So anything that we can do with them, we do. And actually, they oversee our aquaponic system. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. So I know this is kind of the ending, but I really want to share a story about the resiliency of our seed. So right before I came here, and as we mentioned, we're, we're a partner, and we have a son, so we were kind of doing like the last minute laundry. And my, our dryer wasn't working, and of course I'm the one doing the laundry, right? And so, um, so I'm just like, gosh, what are we going to do? It's, you know, we're kind of like taking our time, and, and now we're in like the panic mode, and we got to get going. And so I, was, I turned the back of the dryer and I opened it up because I was thinking, well, I, I'm superwoman. I can figure this out. And all of I, I see are these long strands of grass. I thought were grass. And so I pulled it out and it was a big lint. And it was our white corn growing in our dryer. I am not, and I can share the pictures with you. That literally happened when we left. That is, picture is going viral. And so again, it really talks, it really shows the resiliency of how strong that she is. So when you kind of say, there's no way that this corn could have lasted from your creation story, I'm like, shoot, this is grown in our dryer. So 
again, that's just kind of one of our, our really cool, cool stories. So again, thank you so much for your time and hanging in there with us. Anybody has questions? Are you back? I didn't, I was sad I couldn't find you. Okay. It's my new boyfriend, so. Question for Kyle. Did you consider uh, American buffalo instead of the cattle that you have on your farm? The buffalo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is good. Yep, we do, uh, we have over 350 head buffalo. They're part of our, we actually, the United Nations actually, has a, a conventional farm as well. They farm over 15,000 acres. So they control our buffalo herd. Uh, they run it. Um, we are in the process of maybe trying to have Jinhinkwa get a hold of the buffalo herd because it's more of a natural, uh, cultural product that we believe. And I think that maybe we could probably handle and treat that animal a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, we do also try to educate our own people. You know, it's kind of like, how can we be growing a conventional 15,000 acres of conventional farming, and then you have us, 83 acres, certified organic farm, so there's, there's got to be kind of a middle ground there for us, and um, yeah, we really look forward maybe to the day of, you know, taking over that buffalo herd. Um, I have a question you mentioned before about not selling your seed and things like that, and you had mentioned... Um, having some interactions with Monsanto, and I was just wondering what that was about and what they intended to do with this seed. Well, every year we, we target 200 families for our seed and plant distribution. Um, a lot of times we see people that come in there that we don't recognize. They come in with suits and ties, trying to get a hold of our seed, as well uh, coming directly to our farm, you know, trying to, you know, imposter and, you know, not letting us know who they are and us finding out later, you know, what you know, corporation they were with and trying to actually befriend us, you know, and then, um, you know, making it sound good and then wanting to leave our farm with our white corn seed. And we usually don't do that, just give it away to somebody that we just newly meet. So we, it draws a red flag immediately. We have a lot about what we realize is 11 offices within our area that are Monsanto offices. So they're really looking to come down on indigenous communities. And what they want to do if, uh, that we know of is control the seed world, right? So they really want to try to get a hold of our seeds and our indigenous seeds from, you know, all throughout Indian country. So we've created a declaration to kind of save our seed, protect our seed. And unfortunately, we can't do that with every nation, but we're definitely starting with us because we could not imagine Imagine them patenting our seed. That's not. That is not going to happen. We will. We will be fighting to the to the ends. Yeah, that's not cool. We're, we our next presentation is at noon. But I know this. We have one more question. This is for Kyle. You had mentioned that you don't use pesticides, but you use some kind of apple spray on your corn. What is that? So we use what we call a, a May apple. And that's a traditional uh, plant that we use for our seed sulk, and that protects our seed uh, as we plant it. So it's a natural, a natural plant that we use as a, make it into a tea, and then we have to cool that down. If we were to put our seed into that tea right away, our seed would go sterile. So we have to cool that, cool that tea down, and then we soak it for up to uh, 24 hours. And that just protects it from the scent and also from different insects. You can also use white pine. There's many different traditional seed soaks that you can use. And white, white pine is a uh, woman's medicine. And we say that a seeds belong to our women and our children. And so for me particularly, when I do our white corn, we, I soak it in our white pine. So there's many different options. And it's really about how you're connected, I find. That is wonderful. So you guys got a good earful today of information. Be sure to visit their booth. It's right behind me at Oneida. There's the young lady that's there, look at Arvana. And they have really good information. So thank you, Kyle, and thank you, Mrs. Hey. And thank you for being here and asking those wonderful questions. This is how we share and how we learn. And we're